Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Vice President of Communications and Policy Outreach here at the Centre. I'm delighted to see so many of you here and to welcome our eminent and august panel of speakers to this mini summit. I'm just going to run through a little bit of the housekeeping before handing over to Masood to get things uh, going. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you would mind silencing your phones. Uh, I am going to encourage you to use your phones to live tweet during the event. And if you do so, please use the hashtag CGD Talks. You can see it on the screens underneath our logo all around you. Uh, I'm going to say also hello to everybody who's watching on the live stream. We are live streaming this uh, as it happens. And we will, of course, archive the video on our website where you'll be able to follow the events again uh, afterwards. Um, speakers, thank you very much for joining us in such multitude. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, many of you have microphones that are clipped to your, uh, your clothing, but the uh, speakers on these sides, uh, we have tabletop microphones. Um, we've kept them on mute, most of them, so you just need to press to talk and then press again to mute afterwards. And for our speakers on the end here, there's a, a little button on the microphone here. So that's the kind of boring stuff done for me. I'm going to ask Masood Ahmed, our present, to get us going. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Rajesh. And uh, welcome to all of you and to all of you in the audience, all of you who are watching us on live stream. Those of you who picked up the two-page note on the way in will see that it includes uh, quotes from President Xi that uh, shows that one of the stated goals that uh, China has set out for the Belt Road Initiative is to drive development. And uh, as we were thinking about it and preparing for this, we looked around and we find that while a lot has been written about uh, BRI, uh, not a lot from the perspective of developing countries that will participate in the process and, and what it takes to make it work and, and what the risks are that go with it. So we thought we'd organize this conversation. I'm very glad that we have around the table uh, all the sort of major players that are going to be involved in one way or the other uh, in the implementation of this uh, initiative. And I'm particularly grateful to, to Vice Minister Zhu for, for joining us today. And I want to thank our co-hosts for this event. Uh, EBRD and the Reinventing Bretton Woods Committee, uh, and uh, I will uh, turn to both of them in, in due course, uh, mm -hmm. because I think that helps to bring also uh, different angles in terms of the perspectives that we all bring. So let me, with that, turn over first to uh, Suma and ask him to make sort of opening remarks from the perspective of uh, EBRD, and then we will structure a conversation amongst the rest. Masood, thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, well, we're very happy to be co-hosting this uh, with uh, Centre for Global Development, Bretton Woods uh, Committee. Um, I think it's a really, really important question that's on the table here. We start, from EBRD's perspective, as a strong supporter of the Belt and Road in Initiative. We actually think it's quite an inspiring initiative, but there are some challenges which are in the questions to be addressed about how to make this a success. Let me give you our perspective on why we think this is actually of the moment, if you like, this initiative. We know, to start with, obviously, that increased and sustainable infrastructure and greater connectivity are key, key uh, issues for increasing growth, uh, productivity, jobs, as well as also for attracting foreign investors and delivering basic service. And uh, we know that doing all this, we've got to do it with an unequivocal commitment to sustainability. Now, that vision, first articulated by the leadership of China, is going to require, in our view, the engagement and collaboration of a very broad set of partners. So that's one challenge in itself, how to bring together a set of partners. And this panel, I think, <coughs> reflects uh, the variety of partners that the Belt and Road Initiative now has. And we've got to work very well together. It's got the private sector, obviously, here. We've got the countries that stand to benefit, like Kazakhstan, for example. We've got the architects of the vision, the Chinese government here, of course, and the multilateral development banks as well. The multilateral development banks, from my perspective, are actually absolutely essential to trying to deliver this vision. I mean, it's got to, we've got to mobilize the private sector investment. We've got to work with the countries that we already know pretty well. 
we've got to make progress in addressing, I would call, the so-called soft uh, infrastructure of policy reform and know-how alongside mm -hmm. the investments uh, we want to make. And of course, we've got to bring high standards to bear in uh, creating a sustainable positive impact along the new Silk Road. For the EBRD, uh, I've often said that uh, we were actually tailor-made in many ways to help make the Belt and Road Initiative a sustainable success uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, geographical overlap. Uh, EBRD is now active across three continents. Uh, the term regional bank is a bit odd for us, but anyway, we're a regional bank, but in three continents. 32 of the 37 countries where we work are also part of the Belt and Road Initiative. In Central Asia, where we have really scaled up in the last four or five years, we have already invested some $12 billion now in that uh, region. And we have a very unique uh, <coughs> presence, a uh, combination of presence on the ground, an acute understanding, I think, of private sector needs. Uh, and that's just one region where we overlap. And maybe Kairat, could, you know, he could highlight some of that because we work very closely with him in Kazakhstan as well. I think also the second uh, thing that makes me very optimistic about the EBRD and Belt and Road Initiative overlap is attitudinal. I mean, I think we have very similar attitudes when it comes now to our business models. As you all probably know, EBRD is very private sector focused. Um, our articles actually say 60% of what we do should be in the private sector. We're currently running at 75%. Some years it's been around 80%. Uh, so incredibly private sector, we've got this proven track record of leveraging private sector investment, particularly in sustainable infrastructure. And more and more, we think of ourselves also as a green bank, uh, the green bank maybe. By 2020, we have a target of having 40% of our <coughs> annual investment in the green economy. We're, we're well, on target, uh, well on track to reach that target. In fact, we were at 49% in the first half of this year. So we'll probably achieve this target three years early, and no doubt be pressed by our shareholders to revise the target, I'm sure. But we also have a very, uh, I think, updated modern version now of what a sustainable modern market economy should look like. So along the Belt and Road Initiative, along the Belt and Road, the sort of uh, market economies that we want to help create, we've got a very strong set of uh, understandings now. We, what we did was we refined our concept of transition. Six qualities now, green, of course, but also competitive, inclusive, well-governed, uh, resilient, and integrated. What, why do I mention that? Well, because when President Xi made his speech on the Belt and Road Forum uh, in May, he actually listed four of those values, in integrated, green, inclusive, and good governance, as also priorities for the Belt and Road Initiative. So I think there's, again, great overlap there in terms of values as well. A couple of things to leave you with, I think. EBRD and all, all other MDBs, we, of course, provide more than financing to those who work and invest with us. We're obviously very proud of our application of environmental and social standards. And I think one of the key questions to discuss is to what extent those standards can be applied in the Belt and Road Initiative, levels of transparency, of competition as well, so that we can actually uh, really adopt the strongest standards possible, <coughs> but without disproportionate cost in trying to apply those standards, a, a debate that's being had as well in other fora. And on this, we've been working very closely with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, and we've got uh, joint projects now, and we've been working with them on the procurement rules on the uh, environmental and social standards. Uh, and when we co-financed together, most recently in, in Tajikistan in a road there, we were able to apply these standards in a pretty light way. In fact, actually, the AIB was able to use EBRD's own due diligence, the way I think more multilaterals should do, uh, piggybacking on each other. The second area I think uh, it's worth highlighting from my perspective is the importance of policy reform. Uh, it's all very well being a private sector focused institution, but if we haven't got much to say about how to improve the investment climate in each country so that those countries can attract more investment, foreign and domestic, then we're not doing our job. So I think part of the Belt and Road Initiative has to have an angle on policy reform as well. And we need to work with the governments of these countries to remove those obstacles to attracting more investment together. Now, our Chinese counterparts uh, have invited us uh, in EBRD to join hands in, I think, meeting this challenge of infrastructure connectivity across a much broader geography. For me, the measure of BRI's success uh, will be what Kazakhstan, but also many other countries, will say in a few years' time. Will they say when we meet again uh, that w this has really changed the dial completely in terms of the connectivity and their economic prospects? 
I think, uh, I, I think this has a real chance of doing so, but we've got to be serious and we've got to operationalize, I think, the elements and tackle the obstacles that are bound to occur as we try to implement this. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Silva. So I think you've given us a very nice overview of uh, how you see this, this initiative unfolding and also what needed to make it work. And what I'd like to propose is that we try to structure our conversation in two parts, uh, recognizing that these things never quite work out in practice as you hope. But, but let's start with some structure. And so what I'd like in the first part is to focus on what it will take to achieve the objectives that we are all hoping to get to. So what is it that's going to be needed from each of the players to be able to, to achieve that objective? And, and I'd like the participants to think about not only what is needed from them, but what is needed from others at the table so that they can raise that. And then in a second uh, half, I'd like us to focus a bit on what are the risks associated with this implementation. And uh, in particular, I know one of the issues that a uh, num number of people have already started talking about is the risk of debt sustainability uh, associated with uh, the implementation and repayment of the financing for all of these projects. So that will be a sort of second part conversation which we can come back to. So let's, let's try and uh, focus first on, on how to make it work, what's needed, and for that, I'd like to start with you, uh, Vice President, to see how you see the, the unfolding of this and, and also what you see is required to make it work. Thank you very much. Firstly, I want to thank you and the EBRD President and the Executive Director of the Inventing Green World Committee. I had joined this many seminars regarding world and the Belt and the World Initiative. But for me, that's the first time to join this uh, seminar, totally chaired by foreign institutions. That's not that uh, Chinese counterpart as a co-chair. So I do believe this demonstrates that uh, global reaction to the initiative is how strong. And uh, I'm also very happy the president of University of Nazarbayev Kazakhstan is here. That's uh, four years ago, just in, U in your university, President Xi made this very famous speech. And uh, since then, the Belt and the World Initiative, we will know by the whole world. And uh, regarding the mission, I thought that's in Chinese perspective, I thought that's the president said. President Xi said very clear from the very beginning that the uh, guidance principles, extensive communication, joint contribution, and uh, shared benefit. That's uh, so important. The, somebody at the beginning, that's not. Maybe this is uh, geopolitical tools, and uh, something think that's uh, with some special intention. But after three years, I believe the world understand what has the real contribution by the very important initiative. Particularly at the current situation, global economic development face some challenge, anti-economic globalization, and uh, just look at that domestic issue that's made this real challenge for the global development. So in this regard, I think that's uh, demonstrated how the world so strongly react to the initiative made by President Xi Jinping on behalf of China. That's certainly the initiative made by President Xi without that's the IPR of China. But we strongly believe the result of contribution is belong to the world. We would like to fully cooperation with the whole world particularly the countries on the line. And the president from the very beginning also gave us a very key purpose. That's policy, communication, infrastructure, connectivity, trade promotion, finance cooperation, and people-to-people -people exchange. 
We saw that's the five key policy point that covered all intention China want to contribute to the world as public goods. <coughs> Just last May in Beijing, President Xi Jinping chaired the senior level conference on Belt Road Initiative. The meeting was very successful. 270 achievement reached, and uh, I do believe those one will contribute to the world development and uh, also really contribute to peace and the development in the world. That's, I just say that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guangzhou. Let me perhaps now turn to the, the two country representatives that are here first uh, to hear from their perspective, and then I'll come to the institution. So perhaps Karat first and then Chad uh, Mahmoud from Pakistan. Karat, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So let me first echo to uh, what uh, President Chakrabarti uh, mentioned about uh, the role of uh, sustainable infrastructure development and mostly all the uh, I would say thoughts about the uh, birth and road mostly uh, linked to the sustainable infrastructure development yeah. in the region. So the Kazakhstan, uh, I believe that uh, together with Pakistan and Iran was uh, been chosen like a key country in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative. So we are, uh, always joke that uh, we are like a, a big geographic location of Kazakhstan. Give us a chance to say that we are buckle of this belt. So what we try to connect by infrastructure, the western part of China and eastern Europe. And historically, it was always like this. So you remember ancient Silk Road, which was connected uh, uh, in ancient time, uh, China and the Middle East and, uh, and uh, western Europe. So I think that now we also want to restore it. So, we, but how to do it? And I think that uh, the key question is, uh, we're talking about risk and we're talking about the certain conditions uh, and a lot of the expectations that uh, the, sometimes this expectation, I think that is very similar to the expectation of some kind of uh, charity from the, the Chinese government. So uh, kind of the investments that uh, should be just for the political project. So I believe that uh, here is a, uh, the idea is really to develop it, but based on the two kind of important conditions. So first of all, will be projects uh, which is linked to the uh, not only physical infrastructure, but also the digital infrastructure as well, should be commercially viable and projects should be bankable. So everyone realizes that otherwise it will be unsustainable really to invest so um, a big amount of money. Uh, without these two conditions. From the other side, definitely it should be politically acceptable in, within the countries and everybody should uh, kind of follow their own political agenda. Uh, in a recent uh, summit in Beijing, the President Xi uh, mentioned that uh, the approach here always should be win-win. So based on this, I think Kazakhstan uh, started this program even earlier. Uh, it was not, uh, sim it was very symbolic that the first uh, uh, speech of uh, presidency was done in Nazarbayev University in Astana. But uh, it's not only like a speech, but the Kazakhstan start to connect border with China, with the border, through border with Turkmenistan uh, to Iran and to, to the Caspian uh, region even earlier. So we built more than 2,000 kilometers by all means. And what we are talking now, uh, I think, is a more further development of the infrastructure development, especially in terms of the digital silk road. So back to the uh, the other uh, policy reforms, uh, which should be done, I think, uh, with, uh, alongside the uh, Belt and Road, is uh, soft infrastructure development. And I uh, also agree with the President uh, Suma here that the Kazakhstan uh, start uh, significant reforms. So we called this program 100 uh, Concrete Steps Towards Five Institutional Reforms. And uh, the most important uh, among these five <coughs> institutional reforms are uh, Rule, uh, movement towards rule of law, uh, diversification of the economy and privatization, and also good uh, quality of the civil service. So I believe that this uh, three dimension really gives us opportunities to, to compete and to succeed in these competitions in, in the future. Uh, you know that uh, this year we in Kazakhstan in Astana, we host the, uh, the Global Fair Expo 2017, which was devoted to the theme of the future energy. So everybody, uh, can see that the Kazakhstan is very much committed to the uh, Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And to 
jointly with EBRD, we're also working now on a special uh, uh, national strategy uh, towards the to create the green financial system. And also, uh, I would like just to say a couple of words about the new initiative of the President Nazarbayev is to create the uh, new regional financial services fund, which is, I think, perfectly in line with the Belt and Road Initiative. So in order to deliver it, it was the amendments to the Constitution, which allow us first time among all the post-Soviet Union countries to implement the rules uh, and standards of the English common law. So I believe that this kind of very predictable investment climate also uh, provide opportunities that the Kazakhstan and Astana um, would be the perfect place to create the infrastructure financing facility hub and be a regional financial services hub with even the Belt and Road initiatives. Towards this, uh, also the, uh, uh, was uh, been announced the pro massive privatization program. So all the government-owned company which belongs to the Sovereign Wealth Funds and Rukhadina will be privatized in the next uh, three years. Uh, privatized on the new stock exchange, we, which we're creating jointly with the uh, American NASDAQ and the uh, Shanghai uh, Stock Exchange. So this is also a kind of show <coughs> how the uh, kind of Belt and Road Initiative uh, can connect uh, different cross-border and cross-continent uh, uh, agreements, and uh, the Kazakhstan wants to play significant role in this. So back to... Uh, I think the key uh, moment of uh, the Belt and Road, I know that it's like a very high uh, short-term expectation, but by, I believe that the Belt and Road is a very long-term uh, plan and strategy, and uh, we would like to, to, to play a significant role. Thank you very much, Karo. Let me turn to Ashad Mahmoud. And, uh, Pakistan is another country where there is a, a major investment uh, plan that is associated with the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chakraborty, uh, for providing me this opportunity of uh, sharing my thoughts. Uh, yes, um, uh, Pakistan is one of those countries where the One Belt, One Road initiative has really, I think, started taking, taking shape. But let me take you back uh, uh, from my, from my uh, knowledge of having worked in China uh, I was there from 2002 to 2006, working in the embassy as commercial counselor. And at that point in time, I remember having heard discussions. I, I accompanied my ambassador to one of the meetings, uh, and uh, uh, which was an open meeting, perhaps. But one of the things that one heard over there was, was uh, about regional connectivity, regional development. And uh, much later, uh, and again, I was I was one of those. Uh, I was privileged to be a part of it. Uh, in 2014, uh, the initiative on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank started, and so I, uh, to me, it seemed that while all this was in the works, uh, it wasn't the thought process was there. But uh, perhaps uh, this was the manifestation of uh, how the Chinese government was thinking of uh, uh, opening up uh, uh, to, to not only to its neighbors, but then moving uh, to other parts of the world also. So that was, uh, that was the first part of manifestation that I saw. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, then came the uh, one, road, one Belt, One Road. Uh, project and Pakistan became uh, one of the early countries to, to uh, get to get the investments done, and uh, so the, it it has come in a very large way. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, development works going on. In our case, uh, uh, road infrastructure, rail railroad infrastructure. And energy sector. That was one of one of the areas in which we were deficient in Pakistan, and I, I, I think uh, those were those were the immediate needs. But then I, I think what Pakistan provides uh, geographically is the linkages that it can provide uh, to uh, to those uh, in the north of Pakistan and uh, leading them up to the. Uh, the Arabian Sea. So, the, so that's the connect, connectivity that, that Pakistan 
is providing to this initiative. So uh, we've, been, we've been lucky in that respect. But also then, uh, uh, if you recall, in 2015, uh, the new initiative under the UN auspices came the Sustainable Development Goals. And I, I think this also links in well, or maybe it wasn't uh, perhaps not part of uh, the initial thought process, but, but I, I think it gels in well with, with the entire concept. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yes, well, well, I, I think uh, perhaps uh, later in, in this uh, discussion we'll talk about it. Uh, one of the areas uh, that we all need to look at is uh, the aspect of debt sustainability. That is an area where uh, perhaps uh, most of the countries which are at uh, diverse uh, development uh, levels and so how would they cope with, uh, with the investments coming in? And uh, how do we uh, <clears throat> cope nationally with uh, with these aspects? I, I think those are some of the uh, uh, areas that we would need to take a look at. Similarly, the the, 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 the diverse governance conditions uh, in in number of these countries. So I, I think that these are the areas which will basically define how the one road one belt one road initiative moves on. I'll finish over here and then perhaps come back again. Thank you very much. We've got two country perspectives. And uh, let me now ask the uh, colleagues from the different institutions. So from your point of view, how do you see the obstacles to making this work? Uh, sorry, can I turn to you? Yeah. Um, thanks, Masood, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting the World Bank uh, to be part of this important conversation. And good morning to everybody. I'd just like to start by saying that the World Bank uh, is really supportive of this initiative. We're already very heavily engaged in all, if not uh, most, of the, the, the countries uh, on the Belt and Road. We have infrastructure investments totaling about $80 billion. Dollars. We see this as a real opportunity uh, to support our country some more to go to the next level and really uh, maximize infrastructure uh, for development. Now, uh, Masood, you asked the question, what will it take and who needs to do what? Uh, we've heard from government uh, counterparts. Uh, I agree with a lot of uh, what is being said. I think that uh, we need, first of all, all of us as stakeholders to keep our eyes on the price. This is not just about infrastructure. It's about infrastructure promoting uh, connectivity, integration, and development. You know, and that has to be front and center of everything that we do. Uh, the political commitment on the parts of government uh, to the integration agenda and doing whatever needs to be done at the political level uh, to make it possible to achieve. And then also uh, policies to promote, promote the private sector, to allow the private sector to be there. Uh, because you're not talking about the public sector alone. That's the beauty of this initiative. It's about the public and the private sector working together. So what will it take to get more private and commercial money flowing into infrastructure provision? So clearly, uh, your PPP frameworks are going to be critical on the government side, and how you have clear rules of the game on how the public and the private sectors uh, work together around infrastructure, and how viability gap financing instruments like guarantees will be brought together in a sustainable way to facilitate that. And then you need policies as well that are around facilitating trade and investments. Uh, flows, you know, so that the openness uh, that is needed uh, so that the infrastructure catalyzes the integration uh, that is needed. So as um, was said earlier, uh, the investment climate reforms uh, that are needed. Um, and again, leveling the playing field between different stakeholders. Several of the countries have SOEs. Yes, SOEs, I think, can be part and should be part of the initiative. So making sure there's a level playing field uh, between the public and the private, so the private opportunities uh, are not uh, lost. Let me say a little bit about uh, what uh, the multilaterals and what the World Bank uh, uh, can do to, to make it uh, happen. 
I think it's really uh, supporting uh, the clients, you know, and coming in as an honest broker to bring in the analytic uh, rigor, uh, the evidence base for decisions, for choices about the investments. I think that's really a strong value add that we can bring. Uh, because this is a complex undertaking. We need to understand the economics of what we're getting into. We need to know where the risks are. It's been mentioned, the macro uh, stability issues. So uh, we have a comparative advantage in doing this, bringing this to the table, and helping our clients understand and how they can uh, then participate. We can support the policy reforms uh, that have been said. We have different instruments to bring to the table. And we can support uh, the project planning, uh, which is going to be very important for countries to have strong, credible infrastructure investment plans that become the basis uh, for these investments. Uh, supporting these plans with good uh, technical assistance also for preparing the projects and, and then for implementing them. Then we can also support the structuring of the deals to bring the public and the private sector together. This is another area where we have comparative advantage. And we can bring our financial instruments to bear, whether it's uh, meager guarantees, uh, bringing the IFC, to again make the public and the private uh, come uh, together. I think we have a very uh, strong role in knowledge, facilitating knowledge, sharing knowledge about infrastructure, infrastructure finance, what works, doesn't work, bringing lessons from other countries. There's already lessons on ground that we can learn from. We can learn from what happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, we can learn from some of what happened in Africa. Draw the lessons, make it available to, to all. We're uh, leading on the, the Global Infrastructure uh, Alliance, a facility with other partners represented here, which is really around <coughs> knowledge and bringing knowledge to the table uh, and, and helping uh, monitor it. We can play a role in helping to address some of the corruption risks that we know are there. You know, and and uh, the Chinese government has already uh, worked, approached us to, to work on some of these things. We've had a workshop uh, with counterparts in China around this. Uh, because President Xi had mentioned in uh, some of his statements that he wanted this to be done at the highest ethical level. So I think there's a range of things that the multilaterals can bring to the table, World Bank included. It's, it's great that the Chinese government has signed an MOU with several of the MDB saying, we want to work with you. Uh, we think you can bring value. And uh, we stand ready uh, to support uh, this initiative. So we're very supportive. It's not going to be easy, challenging. But I, I think it's a huge opportunity. And all of us have something to bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Let me open it up and see who else would like to come in next. Okay, please. I'm very happy to join this discussion um, uh, for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and, and thank you for bringing us together. Mm -hmm. um, AIIB is obviously very aligned with the Belt and Road Initiative. In fact, so much so that often we are emphasizing that AIIB is not just about Belt and Road. In fact, we are serving all of the priorities of our member countries, whether or not they are included in Belt and Road or not. Um, but as our mandate is to uh, promote regional development in Asia through infrastructure investments, of course, we are very aligned with the uh, uh, objectives of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, our three straight thematic priorities are cross-country connectivity, sustainable infrastructure, and mobilization of private capital for infrastructure, all of three directly relate to Belt and Road. So my first comment just is very strong alignment and our readiness uh, as uh, the new kid on the block of the MDBs to support <coughs> our member countries with the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, second comment relates to what's the value added from Belt and Road. And I think what is new in this discussion is motivation and coordination. Motivation through a new vision for how to bring investments and policy reforms together for economic integration and the benefits of the region and beyond. Um, I think that motivation is badly needed in a time where there are some doubts about economic integration, trade, connectivity, uh, raised from some unexpected quarters. So I think it's a good time to actually lay out a positive vision about mm. 
the benefits to people, to economies from integration and connectivity. Um, secondly, it's the coordination. Um, some of these benefits from connectivity integration only occur if countries act in a coordinated way, if transport corridors are constructed across different countries, and if policies, the soft elements and the hard investment are coordinated so that there's not just a road, but there's actually a policy that allows goods to cross the road and mm. cross the border. Um, and, and where all the actors, the countries, the institutions within the countries, all are aligned to act. So coordination is really, really important to get the benefits from the idea. And I think that's another value added from Belt and Road. So that's sort of my second main comment, uh, the value added motivation coordination. Uh, then that's my third and last comment is what does it take to make it happen? And you asked, who does need to do what? Uh, that, I think, brings us back to a pretty old agenda, and I think both Suma and Victoria already touched on those issues. Uh, we actually need good policies and good projects. Uh, and, and that's something that many of us have worked on for decades uh, and bring a lot of experience to bear of what does it take to put good projects together, to do sound economic and financial analysis, to do technical sound quality preparation, uh, to make sure environmental social governance aspects are taken care of, to have the right framework for private sector financing, have the right regulation, all those issues, uh, we've many, all of us have worked on for decades. Mm -hmm. I think we can bring to bear here on this sort of new, newly motivated set of challenges. Um, and uh, uh, there, I think as Victoria just said, the multilateral development banks have a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be part of that offering and want to join that collective effort to help our member countries uh, do a good job on that. Because only if that old set of challenges being tackled, uh, will the new opportunity and the new uh, motivation that is brought to bear here uh, yield the benefits for the people and the countries involved? Thank you very much. Um, I had Jonathan and then one time. Yes. Th uh, thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And I can be extremely brief because I think that the points which uh, Jerkim and, uh, and, and Victoria have made, and indeed what Suma was saying at the beginning, encapsulate very well what MDBs can bring to the table. So I just wanted to reinforce that we ourselves, as the long-term lending arm of the European Union, are very supportive of the whole initiative and wish to participate in, in it and wish to provide support. And I think I'd underline just two points. Um, first, that I think, as, as, uh, as people were saying earlier, one of the roles of the MDBs, of course, is to, is to catalyze and to, and, to, and, 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 and to bring, to crowd in uh, private finance, because if we're not going to succeed in, in doing that. We're not going to get the resources available to do that. But one of the ways in which we can help to complement that is, and I think Suma made this point, um, is to, sorry, is, thank you, is to, is not only what we are providing in terms of the resources, in terms of the financial resources which we're providing, but what we can provide in terms of the expertise, the experience which we've uh, gained elsewhere, uh, the application of other policy, um, experiences which we've had and uh, for example PPPs um, that's something which in the case just by way of illustration in the case of my institution we we, we, we have a the European PPP expertise center is in our in our institution we learn a lot from that we can take those lessons and apply them to operations worldwide so I think that uh, we can do that and I'd like to also just underline the fact that of course we like to work very much closely together with our with our partners in the other MDBs in taking this stuff forward so uh, I think that's a that's the key thing which we can bring to the table. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Yes, thank you, Masu. Thank you for inviting uh, Asian Development and uh, together with EBRD and also Mark for inviting me here. President Nicole cannot join. He asked me to come for this. And let me see that uh, uh, ADB has been supporting regional integration cooperation for many years, more than 50 years. This is one of our strategic agenda. So we have been supporting this Central Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, you know, 10 plus 3, among many other Pacific. So many problems of Asia, you know, we have been there for many years. So I think uh, really this BRI, you know, has become really a, a global initiative, you know, advocated by China first, now become a, really a global international initiative. So ADB also joined other MDB, right, together, six MDB together uh, to sign a memo already. You know, we were looking for, uh, you know, that uh, close collaboration cooperation with the BRI and uh, to see how we can, you know, support this very important initiative. And Mr. Drew mentioned about the impact of this uh, regional cooperation on global economic growth and development. So I think, uh, you know, in order to make this a great success, 
I think many things we, we, we should do together. Uh, nobody can do this alone. And uh, from the planning side, and uh, we need to do a very good planning. So, you know, different country, different sector, you know, and different parts of Asia, you know, or even, you know, Europe or Africa. So how, how can we identify a proper project and sectors and we can work together, particularly for those related to the economic corridor, like, you know, how you really link to build that the connectivities with economic activities along that corridors. So it would involve many kind of, you know, planning, you know, also the uh, same, you know, this kind of hub, how you, you know, really try to look for the assignment between the global regional, uh, sub-regional initiative with the country's own initiative, you know, at a different, uh, you know, sector, different level. So how you do that? So this is something really so important, planning, you know, you know, as, uh, as sanitation, you know, assignment among the different initiatives, you know, you know at the country level, the project at level, at the sector level, you know, so important. So I just want, you know, we mentioned about the importance of planning and good uh, uh, strategy for planning, media long-term planning, not just the short one or two years. And secondly, about policy, you know, financing, my colleague already mentioned, nobody can do this alone, 20, you know, based on our estimate, right, $26 trillion from 2016 to 2030 for the Asia Pacific, 1.7 trillion for one, for one year. So nobody can do this. We, MDB, put all money together, just, you know, maybe $200 billion, $300 billion altogether, but still, right, not enough at all. We have to mobilize private sector money. My colleague mentioned about PPP and other, you know, how we, you know, like uh, innovate our financial instrument to, to leverage the private sector. This is the big challenge for everybody here. I think we EDB also has been working very hard on this. But still, I think EBRD, other, I think World Bank, my colleagues, they all mentioned about that. So how can we do to, to mobilize more reserves together? So multilateral, bilateral, private sector, and many, many others. So financing is so important. Policy dialogue also is so important. You build a road, you build a railway, but you don't have a, if you cannot let the goods serve people, right, move the, the border smoothly, what can you do? So you have to have the policy dialogue. How you promote the, the trade policy, you know, trade facilitation. We have been doing that in a different forum, like, you know, Central Asia, you know, in many parts. We are promoting this trade facilitation. How can we help member country to sign the cross-border motor vehicle agreement, transportation agreement? You know, how you promote dialogue among the custom officers, officials. Right, those kind of things. Policy issues, so important. Yeah. And Mr. Zhu also mentioned about this policy dialogue, right, among the country concerned. So I, I just want policy issue. Also very challenging, you know, still many things to do. And the capacity building. These days, among, you know, in Central Asia, South Asia, I can see that. Many countries, right, at different level of the capacity of development. You see, some countries are still very weak in design project, implement project. And, and also, right, to, to manage their, uh, you, know, their uh, you know, their risk. So I think, uh, how can we you know, do more capacity buildings? Of course, MDB have a role there to play. How you do more capacity building in many fronts? I don't have time to go into detail, but capacity building is so important. Knowledge transfer, knowledge sharing, right? So they can learn from each other. How can they can learn each other? So, for, for the, so you know, capacity building, knowledge sharing, you know, so important. And reform, right? Uh, Victor mentioned about the reform. In many countries, if you want to do your mixture project, really to be financial, economic, sustainable, you have to, to, to push for the sector reform. Like in energy sector, you want to do the, you want, you have the power sector. You want, you have to think about tariff, regulatory firm, among many other things, right? You, you do the project, you don't, if you don't have a, a, a good policy here, framework here, just cannot, the project will not be able to sustainable in many of our DMCs. So that's what we are trying to do over the so many years. We still work hard on that. Business environment also, right? Many countries still weak on the you know, business environment for private sector. FDA, President, you know, uh, you already mentioned about this. How can we right, try to more private sector? You, you can have a development zone, economic zone, or the industry part, but if you don't have a business you know, environment here, you may not be able to get FDA. I visited many, you know, this kind of industry part, you know, South Asia, Central Asia, myself. I can see that some you know, has been very successful. You know, some still not so successful in you know, attracting FDA, I can tell you. So, and project risk, you know, also very important, you know, I, I, you know so financially, environmentally, socially, right, uh, you know, technically, many things we, we, we have to, to do, uh, to manage the risk at the project level. And also, of course, political risk, you know, you, you have to build a, the, the mutual trust among the member countries. Of course, you know, I see that very often, when you do the cross-border kind of project, particularly like water resources, you know, and, and some other project, you know, like, uh, you, particularly if the project involves some, some, you know, some dispute area. So, you know, for MBB, we have to be very careful on that, you know. So you, you have to see, you have to get to the, the countries, all countries concerned to support that. Otherwise, you know, we, 
we may, you know, are in big trouble. So I just say we, we have to get this kind of, you know, mutual trust among all, all, the, all the country concerned. So, so maybe I, I, MDB role, certainly, I think uh, based on my personal experience, I see that we are the only broker. Victoria mentioned that, right? We, are, we can you know, facilitate, promote dialogue for, you know, this kind of things. So, you know, uh, we, are, we are trying to be independent, try to neutral, right? I think that's our role. And we can support many things I mentioned already. You know, we, we can be you know financiers, facilitators. So I think uh, you know I, I, I maybe I should stop here. So <laughs> many. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was so it's a very nice list of, of the things that MDBs can do. And and I think I'll just take that and, uh, from the New Development Bank and then the IMF. And then uh, what I'd like to do is get views right. from people who are a bit outside. So I think it would also be good to get. Uh, well, maybe I don't. Yes, also if you wanted to add something. Right before we do that. And then, you know, Michael, you've been hearing the sort of willingness of everybody to say, we all want to be there, we all want to help, all want the private sector to be doing this. You look at it from the private sector side now. So you say, well, so why, what can I do to actually make this happen? You know, are you finding this translated into reality? And, and then I think, uh, Shigeru, you, I know, recently been commissioning a lot of research uh, that you've been looking at some of these issues. So are these the points that are being made here in terms of what needs to be done resonating with what your colleagues who are looking at it from a research perspective are identifying as the obstacles. I think that would be good to hear also. And Harinda, I think it would also be great to get a bit your perspective on, so you have a vision for Central Asia 2050. And, and in that context, how do you see this conversation playing out? So I think we'll come back to that as well. So let me uh, first uh, come to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation for the New Development Bank to be here. This is a very important and interesting forum on the Belt Road Initiative. Let me make uh, three short comments. Uh, number one, I think that uh, while, as uh, Vice Minister Zhu said, uh, this initiative was a China-led, but not China-dominating. So I think probably it's interesting and useful for, for the development think tank like a Center for Global Development Others help develop what I call an international version of the initiative, hearing the voices of the countries, other stakeholders, so we can be more or less on the same ground. Rather than with a lot of confusions, some say this is a part policy tools of China or others whatsoever. Because in the end, in my view, this is an attempt for a new round positively towards globalization. How that really can provide global public goods and services, how to, as other colleagues said, how to make the efforts towards integration of these countries, these economies, into the global supply chain to help them alleviating poverty based on their comparative advantage to develop their economies. So it's not just a connectivity, it's not just a infrastructure. So that's probably my first point. Secondly, I think it's timely. Now we're not only talking about the potentials, we talk about the risks. Certainly, if we really want to see the initiative can be implemented successfully, we need to face these risks at the country level, at the regional level, at the sector level, and also uh, at the project levels. People probably, particularly from private sector, talk about uh, bankable projects. Uh, my view is that probably we should not focus too much on these uh, fully bankable projects because they can be financed either by the private sector and others. We probably need to focus on the second layer. Those projects, uh, they are basically bankable, but still some missing things or the risk are still there, how you address that. From MDB's perspective, since I work in both ADB and World Bank before I joined New Development Bank, we still have a lot of traditional and long time products. It's basically, we're the lenders. We basically lend to the sovereign governments. We need to probably now be out of the boxes, thinking to develop more innovatively the risking tools whether we want to provide more guarantees or we want to provide even some equity into the key infrastructure projects so that the private sector feel more comfortable to come in. And also, how that deal with these countries whose uh, sovereign rating is not yet investment grade. Even that the government is willing to borrow, and as uh, the agenda suggested, 
and uh, they, the, the death of stability, and also how private sector see the, the value of their sovereign uh, borrowing or sovereign guarantees. So that's probably the areas we should focus. It's not an uh, agenda, and uh, we said we need to work together. Uh, MDBs, public sector, and also private sector see how we can develop a, a series of uh, de-risking tools so that really these uh, projects potentially can bring into the picture, can be financed. Uh, my last point is that we need to pay attention particularly to those countries, small, low-income, poor, some of them are landlocked, and also even in terms of a potential connectivities, the benefits may not uh, proportionately um, allocated to them. For example, some countries are on the road for the sort of uh, regional or continental connectivities, but they themselves may not benefit much from that. If you don't now support them, they will be missing link. But on the other hand, if really you want them to take their very limited financial resources into it, probably it's not the right decision. So these things probably need to be discussed in details, and then we'll see how that we can work out. I think that all in all, my conclusion is now it's not time just for what we to do, but how to do it and do it effectively. Thank you. That's a very good point about the small countries as well, how they need to be integrated into it. Uh, Marcus, then I come to Europe. Thank you, Masood, for uh, for inviting us. Um, just uh, three points I would like to make. A apart from the uh, uh, from the clarity that there is no doubt that this is um, it's a huge need for infrastructure investment. There is large resources in China, big technical capacity. So this is a huge opportunity and great potential for this to to work out well. But in thinking about what needs to be done. It's hard to divorce it from uh, the risks that are involved, that this could go uh, uh, wrong. And I think j just, uh, just a second on, it, there are significant risks that we see both for China as well as for participating countries that this could indeed in the end go wrong. For China, uh, the risk that this is a huge government-led initiative that in the end wastes a lot of resources. In China itself, it might facilitate a rush for the exit of money. We have seen um, you know, uh, s some projects sort of getting the BRI label and therefore being able to exit. It should be actually the opposite, that the BRI label should be the highest quality and difficult to get. And then reputationally, of course, for China, um, the reputation uh, risk of having China-only projects, both in terms of the labor it's employed, uh, the procurements and so forth, uh, there are significant risks for China there. For the countries, the risks have been mentioned, debt sustainability, uh, wasting scarce resources, inefficient investment projects, the fact that this could distort governance in the countries lead to corruption, and the fact that it might have very limited diffusion uh, into growth and um, might in the end actually end up being negative for growth if there is large uh, debt sustainability problems involved. So how to do it? I think everything has been mentioned here in terms of project quality, making sure that the financing is on the right scale and terms, um, project selection, project management, after project service, um, and the whole question of how to bring in the private sector, not just in order to add resources, but as a guarantor of project quality um, is, is, is critical. So then in the end, uh, <laughs> since we all have kind of an idea of how it should be done, the question is how to do it. And so far I have seen a lot of general uh, agreement and talk and memorandum of understanding how great this all is, but there hasn't really been a meeting of minds on the framework. So one way to advise China and participating countries to go the next step might really be to put together before you move along with a lot more resources and projects, put together a framework that you all agree on needs to be in place and a meeting of minds on the key requirements for this to work out. That's sustainability. What do we mean by that? For, for, for BRI to go ahead in the country, we need to have clarity about that sustainability. What do we mean about investment <coughs> quality, project quality? How are we going to manage uh, procurement, level playing field for foreign companies or not? All these issues, I think, could be put together, and China, of course, has to be in the lead there, to put together a framework how itself sees the vision of 
these conditions for this to work out properly. And then these need to be translated into perhaps much more detailed, clear framework memoranda of understanding between participating countries. And in designing and formulating that, I think the partners could really be very helpful both to China and to participating countries to, um, to do this in a way that provides a very good meeting of minds, understanding in a much more granular way how will all these conditions be managed before one actually then implements it into concrete projects. Thank, thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you for uh, also flagging some of the risks. But I know that the one about debt sustainability is getting a lot of play in some of the countries where the debt levels are already uh, relatively high and where there is some uncertainty about what the terms and conditions of the investments proposed are going to be, and so what the implications of that will be for debt sustainability in the future. And I think you have a very specific proposal about whether there should be some kind of framework that uh, the, the key players agree on beforehand, uh, within which then the individual operations would proceed. And I'd be good to come back to that at, at some point. Uh, let me come to your stuff now. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Masood, for the opportunity to um, deliver uh, my views here on what I think is really a critical uh, mega project uh, in terms of global integration, in terms of connectivity. Uh, really, I think uh, BRI's contribution uh, to the global economy is really by connectivity, especially to countries uh, that are landlocked, as has been already mentioned, this is uh, very important uh, for uh, countries that are facing uh, constraints and limitations in terms of uh, transportation, in terms of uh, trade, in terms of growth. Uh, and certainly, uh, BRI is probably a unique project that serves to overcome some of these bottlenecks and constraints that are faced by landlocked countries. If you look at the composition of countries that are part of uh, BRI, this is 75% um, of Eurasia's uh, landlocked economies are part of uh, the Belt and Road, and more than 30% of all of uh, the landlocked economies in the world are part of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. So really, this is, I think, um, a very significant contribution of uh, this mega project to uh, development for us as a, as a multilateral bank uh, for the Eurasian Development Bank, uh, this is obviously a key issue because uh, of our six member countries, uh, five are landlocked. Um, Belarus, for example, is the largest landlocked uh, economy in Europe. Uh, if you take uh, some countries such as Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, these are uh, landlocked economies with some of the highest uh, levels above sea level. Uh, so clearly uh, difficult in, uh, in terms of logistics uh, and transportation. So certainly the mission and the objectives of uh, BRI in that regard are very close to uh, our mission and to, uh, to our objectives. So if we're talking about connectivity um, uh, in terms of BRI, I think there are two important uh, points to make here. One is the connectivity between uh, the regional integration projects across uh, Eurasia. Um, that could, uh, in turn, redound to uh, greater um, efficiency of the implementation of BRI. So for example, um, the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union, clearly there is scope for uh, greater cooperation between these two blocks going forward. Uh, the same can be said with regard to ASEAN and some of the other uh, regional blocks in uh, uh, in Eurasia. And uh, on a related note, uh, exactly the point that Mr. Rod Lauer uh, made, uh, I wanted to make with regard to um, regional development banks, uh, global uh, development banks, China-led development banks, all of them working together to create a unified uh, framework uh, that would um, set forth uh, the standards that need to underpin that kind of concerted effort uh, with regard to BRI. And the last point that I wanted to make is that uh, we also should be thinking about um, a macroeconomic framework probably in terms of the policies that are needed to support uh, uh, the effective development of, uh, of BRI. So 
Um, debt sustainability clearly being one objective. Another objective perhaps being policy rules, fiscal rules, uh, other types of economic rules that could be uh, discussed by member countries uh, as a way to coordinate policies and to make um, the policy framework more transparent and predictable. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Michael. Thank you very much, uh, Masood, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this, this event today. I mean, at, at HSBC, we're very, very supportive of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Sorry. Come up again, I think. Ah, okay. Um, and, you know, since since we are the, the, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, I, I guess the clue is in the name, really, um, to, to some extent. I think, I think in terms of the role of international banks uh, such as ours, you know, we, we sit very much at, at the nexus of all of the key players involved in, in the delivery uh, of initiatives such as this. So the in-country corporates, the multinational corporations, the institutional investors, sovereign wealth funds, and so on, uh, and the sponsors, as well as the official sector institutions involved, will all be key clients of ours that we would typically have deep and long-standing relationships uh, with. I think, I think in terms of looking at this from a sort of practitioner point of view, I guess when you look at these sorts of uh, initiatives, often there will be some top-down macro analysis which will say that the infrastructure need associated with an initiative like this is huge, it's X trillion dollars. Uh, the amount of resources available from the official sector is relatively limited, it's Y trillion dollars, and therefore X minus Y is a big number, and that's the gap that has to be filled by the private sector and private financing. I think the, the reality, when you look at it from a day-to-day -day perspective, is often the complete opposite of, of that. And actually, kind of in terms of dealing with infrastructure projects and the financing of them on a more day-to-day -day basis, what you find is that there is a huge volume of institutional and private investment chasing a very small number of projects that, that come to market. So to some extent, there's a sort of paradox here uh, and, and a mismatch. Um, now, I think the, obviously the, the main explanation for that is, is there's a mismatch between the risk appetite of lenders uh, and the risks associated with the projects that may uh, potentially be, be coming to market. So in terms of, of some of the, the challenges, um, I mean, first of all, I think has been said, that one of the, the big differences that an initiative like this can make is to help develop that transparent and bankable pipeline uh, of projects. The second challenge, I think, um, is quite often some of the high degree of policy and regulatory risks associated with infrastructure projects. Uh, not just in the emerging world, in the, the advanced economies uh, as well, um, as has been mentioned. I think in terms of some of the specific financial risks, again, common characteristic of infrastructure risks, including in emerging markets, will be around uh, the construction phase and the early stage of the projects. So often once the project is up and running, uh, there's a steady cash flow associated with it. It's, it's, able for, it's possible for the initial sponsors to, <coughs> to exit and to refinance that risk, and there's plenty of demand for that, but getting over that early stage is difficult. And then third, I think particularly for emerging markets is the um, often the foreign exchange risk. I think particularly although institutional investors can get comfortable with the credit risk around these projects. They can often get comfortable with the illiquidity associated with infrastructure projects. In fact, that's what they like because they're long-term investors and they like the premium associated with the illiquidity. But the foreign exchange risk is often a problem. So in terms of some of the things that we think might help make a difference, first, I think, as has been said by many participants, uh, coordination. So I think there's a question as to whether the rather loose form of coordination we currently have around the Belt and Road Initiative needs to be formalized more, needs to be given more structure. So you know, we've, we've called for a, a multilateral Belt and Road uh, investment accord that might help deal with some of the cross-border issues, that might facilitate cooperation, that might help align investment rules, some of the issues as well that Marcus uh, was raising, and also maybe a, a project office to help to help be a focal point for the development of a specific project uh, pipeline. I think second, I think you know, NDBs are clearly crucial uh, to this. And I think one of the great positives is when we see this here today is there's a huge amount of expertise in the uh, NDBs. Um, there are an ever-growing 
number of uh, MDBs uh, at the moment, and they have a lot of resource. But sometimes I think the question is, how do you make that most accessible, really, for mm. the private sector? Mm. So if you're a sponsor looking to uh, develop an infrastructure project in Central Asia, you might go and speak to the World Bank and the IFC and MIGA. You might go and speak to the European Investment Bank. You might go and speak to the... EBRD, the Eurasian Development Bank, you might want to speak to the Asian Development Bank, the AIRB, the New Development Bank, and so on. If there's a Chinese angle, you might want to speak to the China Development Bank, Chexin, Salt Road Fund, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge number of different institutions, which is a great positive because there's a lot of expertise and resource. But I think the question is, look at, in terms of making sure that the private sector is best able to navigate its way through so it's able to work out where which institution can best help in which circumstance is an area I think that would, that would make a difference. I think in terms of what MDBs can can do, I think as, as, as Jonathan, as Jochen and others have said, I think helping develop project pipeline uh, is key. Uh, helping with risk mitigation is key. I mean, we were involved with uh, MIGA and EBRD in a very interesting project in uh, in Turkey, which was which brought capital market financing to a hospital project in Turkey with some very innovative uh, credit enhancement from MIGA and EBRD. So there are examples out there, but but it, it's complex and it and it and, and it takes time. And then I think I think finally um, related to all of this again, which will help deal with some of the risk mitigation, will be the continuing development of local capital markets, particularly in local currency, in order to help ensure the, that there is capability in country themselves to help address and mitigate some of the risks associated, associated with some of these projects. Thank you very much. Shigeo, could I turn to you, please? Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, many thanks for inviting an institution such as ours. Um, while uh, recognizing and, and, and remembering many of the, of the um, constructive advice that was just delivered by my ex-colleagues, so I think uh, <laughs> I certainly feel part of it still. But I've been asked to talk a little bit about some different dimensions. But before I start, I just wanted to share with you that um, having, um, as you all remember, my Chinese colleagues, having been associated with work on China uh, in the early 90s, in a way when China really uh, started to go full out for opening uh, reform and opening, in a way almost a quarter century after, in a way it's, it's sort of natural that given China's uh, development and growth, that China has taken the next real step and started to talk about opening in a global sense. And also, uh, therefore, being keen to uh, take uh, at least a shaping role in global governance issues from now on. And I think it's, it's uh, where I think the BR BRI initiative should really be, be sort of framed uh, in, that, in that context. Um, my second sense was that, yes, uh, President Xi announced uh, this initiative, uh, September 7, I think, in 2013 at our university. Um, and uh, just reflecting back by listening to, to all the um, comments, I think two things in a way stand out. One was that he, made, he was very careful Actually, he did not talk only, from the beginning, he talked about an economic belt, an economic and social development belt that would link sort of 3.3 to 4 billion people together. So while connectivity and infrastructure and cross-border point-to-point and others were obviously part of it, I think it's important to that uh, we all remember that from the very beginning, the sense of, of creating an economic uh, community was very much uh, in his mind. And the second part was that he also did emphasize the importance of green growth. Uh, already the sustainable, sustainability issues um, and so were already at the fore. Now, um, I, I sort of look at the, the, the program or the initiative as having started out over three years, the first three years are sort of the launching period. 
And I think it was as much important to, in a way, convince both uh, the domestic audience, but also the international audience that uh, this is a serious intent. It was not the facetiously launched one. And um, I think it was important that there were therefore a, a number of, of uh, signal, signaling um, uh, developments that took, took place. Obviously, the creation of the AIIB, the new development bank, and so on, the financial, to show the financial side, along with the Silk Road Fund. But also, um, in, a, in a real physical sense, uh, the fact that in 2015, 14, 15, the, the railway started. I mean, the rail from Chengdu all the way to Europe was launched. The very, in the very beginning, um, people were rather skeptic, but uh, now it's internationally quoted. It has become part and parcel of the infrastructure picture and the transport picture. Those things are, are, are the things that have set, I think, a real, um, uh, have had this real symbolic and signaling uh, uh, value. But now, obviously, now that, and, and sort of the Silk, uh, the BRI forum uh, in May sort of, brought to an end to this very first phase. Now we're in the second phase where we now are starting to indeed have to face the music. Uh, and in terms of the key challenges that I think everybody has been outlining of first having to set out the real framework and also um, you know, put a little bit more concreteness into these principles of openness and inclusiveness and uh, uh, market principles our uh, peace and development uh, and importantly win-win situation for everybody. I think uh, it's going to be very important for the, for the next phase to indeed start to defining these uh, um, concepts that nobody can disagree with, but now we have to get moving in, in, on this part. Um, and uh, uh, all the elements that were already uh, mentioned, I think, are, are, are important input into it. And the role of the international partners, MDBs, and so I think is very important. Now, having said that, um, on, on our university side and uh, some additional parts that I wanted to uh, touch upon. One is obviously the Belt and Road Initiative touches upon five pillars. Uh, connectivity, infrastructure is only one, and trade and investment finance are the other ones. But there's also the whole policy coordination that some have mentioned, as well as people-to-people -people part. Um, and uh, I think uh, one, uh, when one talks about people-to-people, -people, in other words, uh, if one sort of changes a little bit the, the phrasing, it's very much also an attempt to develop, um, in a way, the soft elements and soft power uh, dimensions for, for China to take increasingly leadership. And one of the good examples there, although it's not ostensibly linked to the Belt and Road Initiative, is actually that in April this year, a new Asia University alliance was created, which basically brings together the 15 top Asian universities. It was uh, very much a Tsinghua University initiative, uh, very much backed by the authorities. And the rules of the game are that each country can only have two universities in there. And obviously, immediately, uh, Beijing, Peking University became part of it on the Chinese side. The Shanghai universities were a little bit kept apart, but that's an internal issue. Uh, um, but uh, you know what, what this initiative has succeeded is that, for instance, uh, universities such as Tokyo University, uh, have joined the Seoul National University, Hong Kong UST, and so on, all the way down to Singapore's uh, National University. So you have pretty much all the top universities in the region um, that joined. Um, and uh, for Central Asia, we were asked to join. So we joined because we want to see what's happened. There. But it allows us also, therefore, informally to start sounding out as to uh, look at uh, how BRI indeed will now start to find a different form of implementation in terms of sci uh, science and technology development and research aspect, which is one 
important part that that I think has to accompany any any future development, um, as well as um, the whole area of diversification, um, especially for resource you know heavy countries. Easier said than done. There are hardly any good examples, um, and and I think this is one of the common. Uh, research topics that we already have identified, as well as um, climate change, energy issues, and so on. So though that's, there's a very broad agenda that I think we want to um, address together. Uh, more uh, parochial in terms of Central Asia, uh, we have also been in discussions with the Karak Institute to uh, develop uh, a network of Central Asian think tanks um, and uh, develop sort of the capacity to uh, for, for Central Asian think tanks, including young scholars, to uh, develop the capacity to participate in future policy dialogue. Um, and uh, so that's another part. And together with the United Nations, we're also talking about setting up a center of excellence for a regional center of excellence for the uh, SDG agenda. So in, so, um, in all this, um, we certainly are very much interested in uh, observing the future development of the BRI initiative and hope to make our contributions through the uh, capacity building, institution building, and human development side. Thank you very Thank much. You. Arinda, can I now turn to you, please? Well, let me see if I can make it work. <laughs> I think it should work. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Masood. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you mentioned the Central Asia 2050 work. Johannes Lin, who is the mastermind, is sitting here, so he may want to come in, too. Um, before I go to Central Asia, uh, let me acknowledge that actually BRI covers 65 countries, if I'm correct, Mr. Minister. So we should look at Central Asia in the context that BRI is indeed a global initiative, currently touching 65 countries, and perhaps it will expand further over time, because it is, after all, an initiative which is evolving. So within that global context, uh, let's look at five. Uh, Central Asia, the way we have defined it in our book on Central Asia. Um, I would say that looking at the long-term future of Central Asia, and they're all landlocked, as you mentioned, um, to us it will seem that it's a very historic opportunity uh, for Central Asia to once again become, if you would, the crossroad between the greater Eurasia continent, between Europe and Asia, or eastern part of Asia, but also the Middle East, and through Middle East into Africa. And that's where what Shigeo said, it becomes crossroad to three continents, and three and a half, four billion people, because Africa is growing very fast. So that's why I think, as Johannes says correctly, um, it could be a true crossroad. And for that, you need physical connectivity. But not only physical connectivity, but you begin with the bedrock of development, which is a physical connectivity, and hence, Many people use the short term of the new Silk Road, though the seven corridors are much more than the old, old Silk Road. Um, and it could be historic, if well done. I should, by the way, note of the seven corridors, only two go through Central Asian countries. The five are going through other routes. So that's point number one. Um, the second point I want to emphasize what the minister said and what Shegeo just 
repeated. Belt and Road Initiative actually has five major themes. Though most people somehow end up talking about the physical connectivity element and infrastructure, because that's the really most concrete thing. But in my view, certainly for Central Asia, but for all 65 countries, the real prize lies in three of the other themes. Policy coordination, Mr. Minister Zhu, you mentioned already. Trade, investment, and financial flows. And that's where connectivity with East Asia is the ultimate prize for Central Asia and other developing countries of those 65. There are tremendous financial resources, not only in China, but also other parts of Asia, East Asia. Trade, the biggest trading countries in the world are in Asia, East Asia, including, by the way, South Asia now, and certainly Japan, which people don't talk about, but certainly China, and investment. And of course, there is investment in Europe. So if well done, once the bedrock of infrastructure is in put place, and there is soft infrastructure, which Sir Suma correctly emphasized very much, because physical infrastructure does not do the trick unless you have the soft infrastructure and logistics take, taken care of. And if the policies are put in place, then you get the real price, in my view, which is trade, investment, and financial view. I think that's what the price is. This is what the country should be looking for. To me, the real BRI are those three things. And physical connectivity is the beginning of the process. And the more we focus on that, the countries and the multilaterals, the better. And my final point, which was a central part of our Central Asia 2050, was regional integration. There are only 65 million people in Central Asia, five countries. Each one of them is very small by itself, compared to not only China, but European countries. Individual markets are very small. For them to have weight in the world, they need to open up to each other. And it would seem to us that recent developments in some of the countries in the region are finally opening up <coughs> possibilities of greater dialogue amongst the countries and possibilities of regional integration. With infrastructure being built with help of BRI, but not only with help of BRI, there is the legacy infrastructure from the days of Soviet Union. Turkey is building some infrastructure. European Union is doing things. EBRD has done work. Under CAREC, ADB has done work. The Indians are trying to make some efforts. So I think if one looks at all of the actors already, on top of it, there is BRI. Things can be done in Central Asia to have a breakthrough, not that the political environment is better. So I think one should keep in mind also regional integration in addition to BRI. Thank you. Thank you very much for it. I think it's a very nice way to kind of put this conversation in context, which is a lot of it really was about the physical infrastructure. But I think it's nice of you to remind us that, in fact, as, as did Shigeo and, and uh, the Guangyao before, which is that there is a broader uh, agenda of uh, context within which we're looking at. So just to conclude, let me ask Suma if there's anything you would like to add at this point, then turn over to Mark uh, to a close for us. Thank you all very much for participating. I mean, first of all, I thought it was a really interesting set of perspectives. I think I took away three or four things, um, which uh, of course we'll want to follow up on. One is, uh, you know, again, a reaffirmation of the importance of bankable, viable investments, good project selection quality, but also this de-risking uh, point came out quite strongly. And I think we need to focus in on that as well, uh, how to make it easier for the private sector actually to engage on these investments. Policy reforms, I think of two sorts, came through for me as well. 
One is the internal type things. What, what can countries do to improve their investment climate, the development of local uh, cap, uh, capital markets, local currency lending, of course, but also at the, at the point of where borders, um, you know, bo at the point of borders, because we need some harmonization of rules and policies to make actually some of these investments work well across borders as well. Thirdly, debt sustainability has come through quite clearly as another issue uh, for me, I think, and therefore also emphasizing the need to focus in on leveraging private sector financing, mobilizing that very importantly. Uh, the diverse governance conditions, capacity building in human capital. I'm really grateful to Shigeo in particular, I think, for highlighting that this isn't just about um, you know, uh, investment projects and policy reform, but it's also there's a whole uh, concept of how to bring the research together, I think, around this, what makes these countries uh, progress. So I think that's very important. And final point for me that came through for a number of you, which is something I think as there is some work going on in Beijing in particular, is this question of trying to create a unified framework uh, and uh, coordination, both at the project level, but also what would constitute success? Uh, how would we know in 10 years' time whether we've actually made progress in the right direction on this? And I, I think we're working, I know, quite closely with the Chinese government and other multilaterals on this. But I think we need to come up with a real offer together on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Masoud, uh, well, thank you very much for co-hosting uh, the RDG7. When we talk about it, I said, look, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a major uh, undertaking. I see it as a new chapter for globalization. And I see here that we have a common partition, but what is missing is maybe the uh, shift of the orchestra. It's because if I look at the analogy between the Belt and Road Initiative and the Marshall Plan, when you have the Marshall Plan, you have a backbone. That was a creation of an institution, a secretariat, the OECD that became later the OECD. So I think what is missing at this moment with the Belt and Road Initiative, you need a secretariat. And I think for Mr. Suma, I strongly believe that the EBRD can become an anchor, a secretariat for the Belt and Road Initiative because you cover most of the countries. You have the expertise related to infrastructure, to investment, to green finance, and so on. And when we talk about the risk related to the Belt and Road Initiative and the issue of debt sustainability, I think for our Chinese friends, and it's part of the global financial architecture debate, China should join the Paris Club. And I think uh, it would be very important to, as a signaling effect for the countries who are part of the Belt and Road Initiatives. So you complete, this is a new chapter of globalization, China becoming a responsible stakeholder in the global finance, is becoming a member of the Paris Club and anchoring a secretariat to showcase it's not only Chinese led, but China wants to play an important role to make globalization sustainable in the long run. Thank you. Okay, Mark. So this, uh, <laughs> we now have a very specific proposal for you, Gwang to take back. So uh, we will have more conversations on many topics, but including on uh, this particular one that Mark has raised. So thank you all for coming to this discussion, and uh, thank you all for participating in it. Thank you. Thanks very much.